Let's have a look in this section at an area of concern when dealing with databases, and that's certainly backup and restoration procedures that are associated. So let's just label this backup or snapshots as it's known within the Cassandra realm and restoration procedures. So ideally with the Cassandra cluster, since data are distributed, there is a less likely probability that you will lose data and have to, as a consequence, resort to tape or disk or, let's say, offline storage. However, it would be imprudent with any important data store to not have some sort of backup mechanism in place with tested restorations, perhaps in a staging environment, as is usually conducted in production environments. So it's just par for the course. It's considered to be standard operating procedures that you have these methods in place. Whether or not you end up using them with Cassandra is a separate issue. So the many features provided with Cassandra tools, and it's largely a node tool that affects the backups or the snapshots and restorations, include, of course, hot, online, point in time snapshots and restorations. So by hot we mean we don't take the nodes offline so nodes remain online during snapshots. And of course this essentially amounts to less downtime because you don't have to take the host down and interrupt IO and because let's just also note another thing that comes to mind because of the dynamic snitch that all nodes implement Cassandra will ensure as a consequence that nodes undergoing snapshots reroute traffic due to of course current load conditions so if a node's very busy with I.O., disk base I.O. as, of course, backups tend to be disk intensive, then the dynamic snitch should, should slip in and notice the imbalances, unless, of course, you're snapshotting all the nodes in the cluster at the same time, which is not recommended. So it's in hot, online, and we should also note that you should snapshot, as you do when you start the cluster, in a staggered fashion simply to reduce IO and that'll keep your performance in tip-top shape because Dynamics Snitch will be able to reroute traffic for you accordingly. Of course that begs the question if you snapshot in a staggered fashion how does it impact the consistency of your data? So we start with 110 and then by then presumably data may have changed on 111 then 12 and so on throughout the cluster. Well consistency is handled by Cassandra. So data consistency is eventually, and this is what's meant by eventual consistency, resolved by Cassandra. As we saw, for example, with a quorum of one, whereby in some instances we saw one record, others two, sometimes three. Well, eventually, either through the imposition of a quorum level or some other level that's higher than one, and with the timestamps associated with different records, all of the Cassandra nodes that are responsible for a given key space will come up to date. And of course, you can always run a repair across your nodes to ensure that you enforce or impose that consistency. So data consistency is handled. Need not worry about it. And again, so long as you use quorum, let's just note consistency relies heavily on a balance of levels and of course performance and this is as we've already mentioned specified by the client so ie if you use a sensible suggested level of quorum then this will usually demand or require that one less than the replication factor or somewhere thereabouts provide consistent results. So usually insists that one less or so than the replication factor number of hosts, of course, 
present a consistent set of data. So if you're using a sensible consistency level, even through restoration, so long as, let's say, quorum equals two or three, so long as two or three nodes agree, then that should overcome any data inconsistencies that you may experience. Now, what happens when you take a snapshot? Again, some more theory, but it's important to know. We know that Cassandra relies heavily upon in-memory tables like memcached and other NoSQL tools. So it does a lot of its work from memory, which is why Java takes into its heap so much of your memory from a quarter to a half, unless you specify otherwise, which means it aims to do a lot of its work in memory and via the commit log or the transaction log, if you will, aka the transaction log. And occasionally, depending on the algorithm you select, whether it's a default 10 seconds or some other schedule in a batch mode or otherwise, Cassandra dumps or flushes the results that are in memory and the commit log to the SS tables or the consistent storage, the long-term storage files, the DB files, that is. So a lot of work happens in memory. So the in-memory tables, when you take a snapshot, are flushed to the disk-based tables or the SS tables as they're known on disk during the snapshot. So this generates I.O., but it depends. If JNA happens to be enabled, so let's just note JNA improves, and you'll see with your startup of Cassandra instances, and this is why we suggest you foreground all of your instances in the cluster until you arrive at a consistent configuration. But JNA improves performance via its ability to talk directly to the operating system using traditional operating system semantics such as hard links, which, as you may know from various Linux CBT studies, require far less I.O., than copying data. So let's say you've got a 500 gigabyte file that should be duplicated somewhere else in your file system. Copying that file, even on today's fast, let's say, solid state drives, will take a while. It may take perhaps tens of minutes, dozens of minutes or so, even on the fastest hard drives. However, hard linking merely references the underlying inode, which happens in a blink of an eye or almost instantly. So JNA allows Java-related applications such as Cassandra talk directly to the operating system and access traditional Unix, Linux semantics such as hard linking. And this is done as opposed to, as we've mentioned, to copy procedures of the SS table files. The SS table files are the data files, and these files are, of course, in the data directory, which by default is in varlib Cassandra data being your top-level hierarchy. Tantamount to varlib MySQL is a top-level hierarchy or container for MySQL databases. So beneath data, you'll find the various key spaces and the tables or column families contained within. So in-memory tables are flushed to disk during a snapshot. And if JNA is enabled, meaning JNA jar, whatever version you happen to be using is available and Cassandra sees it when it fires up, then Snapshotting should be a quick process. Otherwise, it can be a very slow process because copies need to occur as, con as a consequence. Additionally, the snapshotting allows us to take pictures, if you will, or points in time of various nodes of your Cassandra hierarchy. So it facilitates snapshots at various levels. And this is again tantamount to say MySQL, which allows you to back up the entire data store, let's say all databases using the dash uppercase A option or the long form all databases or distinct databases with their tables. So we're able to take snapshots say of all key spaces, which means give us a comprehensive, you can call this a comprehensive run, if you will, which may work for your configuration. Just take one big snapshot of everything every time you take a snapshot. Or perhaps due to the nature of your data, depending on how it may or may not change, maybe single key spaces may be more advantageous for you. Perhaps some key spaces store more or less data, resulting in fewer or more backups. And as granular as single column families 
or tables. So these are the different levels within the Cassandra hierarchy with, that we're able to snapshot on demand. And as a consequence, you can come up with scripts that will snapshot any and all of these levels to suit your needs, so it's rather flexible. Again, just another word on consistency. It's always an issue when talking about databases, especially distributed databases. Eventual consistency is inbuilt or built in to Cassandra for restorations. So that means if you restore a set on a given node, eventually the cluster will become aware of those changes because timestamps are associated with all data again. Ensure that NTP is in use to keep the nodes in sync. Insofar as the main tool that's used, it's Node Tool. So Node Tool handles snapshot operations. And we can use a variety of methods to restore the data. Snapshots are stored in the event that you're using, let's say, a third-party application or a homegrown script to fetch those items. Beneath the typical data hierarchy of varlib Cassandra data, and within the key space, individual key spaces, so let's say key space name is the placeholder, Within a given table, for example, let's say a table name, you'll find references to snapshots such that you'll be able to restore them individually if necessary. So that's where you'll expect to find your data. Now it's also important to note as a feature, perhaps because it gives us the ability to roll back as far back in time as need be, old snapshots are not deleted by default. So there isn't a built-in mechanism insofar as up to 1 to x is concerned to roll over, for example, like with log rotate, the older items. So the workaround is for you to determine what needs to be wiped using node tool and clear snapshot. This allows us to clear all old snapshots. So the idea is that, and of course this is to conserve space, that Cassandra gives us the basics to roll snapshots into each node. Then it's up to us to use a third party. So this facilitates the use of, let's say, third party means. So it could be, for example, commercial backup software or homegrown script, or perhaps a script or process you found online to perhaps offload the data from each node. So facilitates use of third-party means, etc., to offload data, and we should say snapshots, from each node to, let's say, off-site, tape, etc. So the mechanism is there to take a snapshot at a point in time. You can stagger it across your nodes. You can offload it to tape or some other means, maintain it. And in the event, of course, of an emergency, just like with the standard DBMS, we have the means to restore. We simply go through one of the many suggested procedures to place the ideal snapshot on a node. And then eventually the rest of the cluster will be restored to that set of data, for example. Another feature that's supported is incremental backups. So if you're dealing with terabytes of data, it may be less than ideal to take full snapshots and offload them, say, to tape or disk or otherwise for storage off-site. So it may be ideal to take one large snapshot, let's say, of your 30 terabyte distributed database managed by Cassandra, and then your incremental gigabyte changes on a daily basis. Now, this feature is disabled by default, so what you want to do is consult Cassandra YAML and just grep incremental. So, grep incremental in this document. You'll see that it's default, set to false, set it to true, but it generates a lot of files from the first or from the official snapshot, and it is the files are not cleaned up by default. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Let's just note that the incremental, in other words, it's still in development. 
increment, but it's not necessarily beta. Incremental snapshots generate loads of data that are not auto-managed or purged, etc. So it's incumbent on you to keep track of, so this requires that you track the full and various incremental files to reconstruct the data set. Now luckily the incremental files are all dumped into one directory so it's rather easy to reconstruct. However, you could corrupt your data if you mix and match files in the wrong fashion and perhaps this is the reason why it's currently disabled. So the notion is you take full snap sh snapshots for now and then offload them as necessary. Now our data set's small so of course for us it's simply full. But the incremental is there if you'd like to experiment with it to see how it works for your data set. Again, it's all data set contingent. So large data sets, rapidly changing data sets, not so rapidly changing, small data sets, etc. So let's take some snapshots. And we'll do so, let's say, on a single node. And our camera, of course, will be node tool snapshot. So from any node, node tool snapshot, you see the options, the optional means of specifying the different levels of the hierarchy from the top level, which indicates all of the key spaces managed by Cassandra to the individual key spaces and their tables contained within, because sometimes some tables change more frequently than the others. So here's a node we're connected to Linux CBT Ubu Serve 2, for example. If we just do a node tool from this directory, you'll see, and just grab snap for example you'll see that in order to take a snapshot use the snapshot option and notice the square brackets indicating these options are optional so for example if you specify one or more key spaces then those key spaces will be included as part of a snapshot on the node again it generates a lot of io if you're using jna it reduces the amount of io and you need read as well as write privileges to the data tree varlib cassandra data in order to one connect to and two write to the storage hierarchy. So node tool snapshot. Let's go ahead and get this going for this node. Rather straightforward requested snapshot for all key spaces. This again is tantamount to MySQL, a dump of all databases. Now notice this stamp. If you compare it, let's say to plus percent s for example, and you look at the timestamps, so one, three, five, nine, six, four, seven, six, and this gives us more precision as to when the snapshot was taken. So what's actually happened? Let's take a look at var lib Cassandra data. And there are key spaces, again, defaults of system, system auth, system traces, and our two simple key spaces. So what happens if we look at web app one? Well, it's got one table users. And now we see a snapshots directory. Inside of the, each of the tables directories or column families as they're known within Cassandra, we'll see DB files. And those DB files represent the data, the indices, statistics, summaries, and so on. Now let's take a look at snapshots and we should see that the timestamp associated with this particular snapshot is evident. And in it, we see references. So how did it quickly make these files? Well, if JNA is enabled, it's simply hard linked. Otherwise, it copies it into that snapshot directory. Again, let's take another snapshot, see what it does this time with a new unique timestamp. So let's take a look at snapshots, one level up. Now we've got another snapshot. Again, our data set's small, so we don't really see the performance gains until we grow the data out. And you can take them as rapidly as you need, and it's per node, and then you can break the node or delete data and restore accordingly. So for a single node, it's as simple as that. Node tool snapshot. For single tables, single key spaces, just append. Include the key space, and then only that key space will be impacted. So for example, you'll see a third instance momentarily. So this takes a picture, if you will, using hard links if JNA is enabled of full Cassandra DB store, which basically means all key spaces, nothing new there. And again, this is similar to MySQL dump with all databases as the option, which is the long form, which dumps the standard out so you normally send it, let's say, to a file. 
So let's say day plus percent F, for example, using maybe backticks. And typically we construct something that looks like maybe MySQL dot backup, which includes the item and because it's SQL, maybe we even tack on an SQL suffix. So that's what it's tantamount to. And similarly, node tool, snapshot, and of course the options drilling a little bit deeper. So node tool, for example, let's do a node tool grep. We'll drill a level deeper. Let's grep snap again. So here we indicate the key spaces. So let's say web app one is the one that changes more frequently. So simply tap on web app one as a key space. You can specify multiple key spaces if necessary. Just space them out and those will be the ones that will be snapshot accordingly. And again, if you take a quick look, say at far live Cassandra, the data directory for any of them, if you have a look at star, maybe star snapshot. So star would be the individual items and then say snapshots, for example. Let's take a look. And that's going to be star for the key spaces, star for the tables, and then snapshots. So what we should see for web app one, let's take a quick look, is an additional snapshot indicating that, and here's web app one. So it's got three, but the others have two, and that's exactly what we expect to find. So this gives us a quick sense. And then again, you can go a little bit deeper indicating the distinct tables, but for our intents and purposes, it's not necessarily applicable because we have simply one column family per key space. So focuses on a single key space. And this dumps all available snapshots using, of course, the default directory hierarchy. So that's nothing fabulous there, nothing major about taking snapshots. To take snapshots on multiple nodes, a number of methods exist. So take snapshots multiple nodes. One option is to run node tool. So run node tool with snapshot against multiple hosts. However you specify the hosts, you can use the host option, which is the H option. So normally you do something such as H hosts and either feed a file or loop it through one node at a time. Another way to have things run simultaneously is to run node tool snapshot via PSSH because this parallelizes it for us. For us. And that does so for the instances of node tool by connecting in parallel opening multiple sockets so this opens simultaneous sockets to targets and executes command now if node tool exists in the same path on all nodes which we've made consistent such as home cassandra in this full path that's fine maybe as part of your setup process you symlink node tool into user local bin which virtually all linux distributions provide so b1 could be for example we do a parallel ssh prompt for password maybe read a host file and since we're on this system we don't have one here so we'll create one so we'll simply call it maybe in our home directory temp cast hosts login as cassandra well first we want to log in as root to make the symlink and then log in as cassandra to do the snapshot so we'll log in as root and then LNS, the full path to Cassandra. So let's do a PWD. That's the full path that should exist on all nodes. Followed by node tool. So that's going to be this source node tool into say user local bin. And that'll make it accessible to all users in the system. Now, so far we have not secured Cassandra. In fact, job, to secure job applications tend to be 
tends to be a straightforward effort. It's usually just a definition of one or more files with permissions such as read-only, read-write, and maybe permissions on key spaces. So it's rather straightforward. Just consult the Cassandra documentation. You'll see that it's not such a big deal to implement. For now, everything's open because we just want to illustrate the features. So this will give us symlinks accordingly. Let's go ahead and copy this and let's build quickly. in our home directory temp. Let's make sure we have one here. Our CAS hosts file in it will have Linux CBTs. Now, since we're on two, in fact, we're gonna have it done on everyone, but we'll omit our existing one since we're all logged in. So this will be Ubu serves one, as well as three, and then two, three. So that will be the list of hosts. And insofar as referencing it to SSH, the remote systems, we'll do so as root. So let's paste that in. We'll read CAS hosts, login as root, LNS, user local bin. Let's see how this works out. And we need an extra double quote here just to keep everything. And now we don't actually have it on this system. So let's do an SU. And we'll get parallel SSH going. That's SSH. And it found in the description. So we'll just take it as that. And that should get it going momentarily and we'll drop privileges. Again, as part of your setup process, perhaps symlink it so it's part of setup process symlink maybe the following no tool sql shell and if you're concerned about access to the databases just have a look at the off documentation now let's drop privileges and see what's happening here we'll do a which parallel and that looks more like it. So let's try this yet again. That's going to be with a terminating double quote. And let's try to authenticate onto each of these nodes. And this is going to try to each of these systems. Let's just make sure that the resolution finds the nodes. Do a quick dig. And it knows where that host is. Let's try three. That one it doesn't know. So we seem to have some sort of resolution issue. So what we could do is double check the mappings or change them off to IPs. And also let's try to log in as root to say one of these hosts, say 75120. This will definitely cause it to fail. The fact that it needs to wait for the key And that will generate the timeout. If we turn on verbose, we might get some additional data to help us see what exactly parallel SSH is complaining about at the time. Since we haven't set up from this host, it generates errors. From the other host, UberServe1, it would just work. And let's connect to 110. And 112. And then if we modify our temp cast hosts, let's make this 110, 12, 20. And our name resolution changes often because we're always oscillating between videos, so it throws things off. So let's see what happens if we try to reread this into parallel SSH. And that's more like it. So resolution, things change, no problem. So now we have symlinks on those remote systems. And we can always kill one of the instances and double check. Locally, we don't. So let's SU. 
LNS, the full path. Let's just take it from here into user local bin. And that should be more like it. So let's do a which node tool. So now it's available and we can then take snapshots. It's just a matter now of parallel SSH to get to it. And that'll be to actually take the snapshots. So B2, let's take this, is simply as follows. Parallel SSH, read the cast hosts list, log in as Cassandra. And instead of this full LN, we'll simply no tool because user local bin is included by default and take full snapshots of the entire tree and that'll get everything going for us. So it's that simple. But again, there's questions surrounding, of course, your data as it grows beyond manageable sizes to take full snapshots. And if you're not using JNA, whether or not it'll occupy too much space and take too long and generate too much IO and so on and so forth. So let's see what we can do here from this node in this particular instance. So parallel SSH, node tool snapshot, terminate that with quotes, connect each of the nodes. Let's authenticate. And let's see what it's doing here. So 110, 112, 121, 122. And let's try giving it the full path. It should have picked up the user local bin. And just because it comes back with a failure doesn't actually mean that it's failed. It could be because of the way the command returned. It may not have yet returned an exit status of zero, but parallel SSH returned before then. So let's take a look at each of these nodes. We should be able to determine rather quickly whether or not items have been written arbitrarily. So if we take a look, say, at arbitrarily, maybe UbuServe 3, let's SSH to 75112. And then LSL var lib data, or var lib Cassandra data. So there are key spaces, web app, let's say web app 2 arbitrarily. Subscriptions is the column fountain, there's the snapshots directory. So it's actually done, it's just the return took a while, and there's a twice, the two instances. So it's backing it up, it's taking the instances, and from there we can actually restore. So restoration is largely after having removed some sort of data from one of the nodes, let's say using a delete or drop key space, for example, and then restoration. So you drop a key space, very quickly all the nodes forget about the key space, and then you restore it. So let's go ahead, this is actually work, so Note the return error from PSSH does not reflect the actual status in this particular case. So you have to check it sometimes. Now, let's remove data. So the simplest thing you can do is remove a key space, for example, using a drop command from any of the nodes. So let's say for MubuServe 3, we do a Cassandra. SQL shell. And let's do a description on the various key spaces that are available. So there's web app two. So if you do a help drop, drop key space, web app two, and let's do a describe again and see what's there. So web app two is gone. Now we should confirm this from say some of the other nodes just to be sure it's gone. Now just a quick point. Now that we've dropped the key space, let's take a look at var lib Cassandra. That begs the question whether or not in data you still have the key space web app too. You do. And let's take a look at subscriptions. No data, but snapshots. So be sure not to remove the tree because the snapshots are still there. So let's just note that, well, for SQL shell, followed by a drop key space web app too. this will remove data hierarchy on the file system sans snapshots. And this is where we're able to restore. So, i.e. var lib Cassandra data web app 2 
And in the case of subscriptions, so let's just say table name, for example, or column family name, contains no .db and associated files such as indexes. However, contains snapshots dir. And let's just note, do not remove snapshots dir until you have offloaded elsewhere. So to tape or disk, USB stick, what have you. That's what your saving grace will be. So the snapshots are there, all the nodes have it. Now what about the directories on the other nodes? Let's start connecting to each of them. Maybe beginning with this node, let's take a look at varlib. This is ubisurf2 now, we've dropped from three. Cassandra data. Web app 2 looks like it's there. Subscriptions appears to be there, no data, but snapshots of course. Now, again, be with respect to the eventual consistency notion, since we stagger, even though we've used parallel SSH, there are bound to be time differentials across the nodes. So we stagger really, even if it's by nanoseconds, but more so maybe milliseconds, we stagger these snapshots. So there are bound to be variances and s various nuances across your data in fast changing data settings. And that's where Cassandra will handle it for you by bringing things to a consistent state based on the nanosecond differentials across the various column families. So you need not worry about the timestamps reflecting slightly differently across the nodes. Again, note each snapshot on each node in the cluster, and in particular, as the cluster grows, in other words, to include more nodes will generate variances in the associated timestamps associated with the snapshots, timestamps of snapshots. And let's just note you need not worry as Cassandra will reconcile post restore. And if there are any concerns, you can always do a repair on each node. So node tool repair per node. Let's just quote this. We'll expedite synchronization of data. So no need to worry. And again, Restorations should be few and far between. It should, if anything, not necessarily occur because a node has failed or one or more nodes have failed, but rather because of user error, developer error. You've clobbered something, you've removed data. One of your front end functions through a PH script, PHP script maybe invariably or inadvertently removed data. So it's usually user error, some sort of error that's gonna generate a restore request. So there are multiple methods to restore, let's say in this case, a key space or table or some records from the database. One is you pick a node, stop Cassandra, and start cleaning up. So let's look at one particular method. So let's look at the restore, and let's just note that multiple methods exist, but we're gonna use one of them. So the first thing for us to do is to stop Cassandra. on a given node. And if you're going to restore on multiple nodes, then do so on multiple nodes. But the idea is that once you populate your, rest your restored data to a given node, it'll then propagate that information to the other nodes and they'll eventually resolve the discrepancy. So stop Cassandra on a given node. So arbitrarily pick a node that's responsible for that data. Again, remember key space information happens to be spread in a way that you've determined up front. So you'd need to know who hold, held a node, etc. But you can place it anywhere in the in the cluster and it would be no problem whatsoever. So let's say we take, since we're on this window, we serve one, we kill this. So that stops the node. So it's not running. Now we need to get rid of the commit log because the commit log is read to ensure the discrepancies between the latest data that's appended and the SS tables, the permanent data store, eventually sync. 
every 10 seconds or in batch mode or otherwise. So clear commit log directory. And that's simply going to be a remove RF var lib Cassandra. And you need not be root to do this. Commit log star. Now the commit log hierarchy, unlike the data hierarchy, if we take a brief look at var lib Cassandra data, for example, this is the data tree. This is the commit log tree. And if we take a look at commit log, you'll see that it doesn't contain other directories such as a hierarchy relating to key spaces, embedded tables, and snapshots. So it is safe to remove the tree, varlib, Cassandra, commit log, everything within, preserving, of course, the top level directory. So the commit log is now empty, so there are no differences to be written to any permanent SS tables once Cassandra is fired back up. So that's clean. Once a Cassandra commit log is clean, the next step for us to do is to clean out the key space DB files as they exist. So for example, varlib Cassandra data in the key space name web app one. Any DB files that are associated, clear them out. Now when you drop a key space, there should be no DB files associated. So for example, varlib Cassandra, let's just get this from our memory here, data web app two is the key space name should contain no DB files for subscriptions because we dropped it. It'll contain snapshots, but no DB files. So the idea here is to populate this directory with the DB information, the DB files and from the snapshot that was taken. So if you see DB files in this directory, get rid of them because they'll be inconsistent. So ensure no dot db files exist within the key space directory. So for us, that's an IE of var lib Cassandra data web app two subscriptions, for example. That's the loan table that we have. So you want to make sure that there are no db files in this particular directory. Clear it out. Once you've confirmed that, we can copy the most, whatever we've determined to be the most recent snapshot data. So copy most recent, and this can be all scripted, of course, recent snapshot since the timestamps are using Unix Epic time stamp. So copy most recent snapshots data from the default var lib Cassandra data the name of the key space, which for us is web app one, web app two, that is, that we've clobbered, the table, which is, or the column family, which is subscriptions, snapshots, and the name of the snapshot. So it's up to us to determine which one's the latest. So let's take a look. Subscription snapshots. Well, we've got ostensibly three. So the latest one is going to be 31st, 11, 14. That should be this directory. So we want all the items from this one because it's the latest. So for us, that's the latest. So copy all the DB files from this particular item. Copy all of the, the data from here into the original table name. So from to var lib Cassandra data web app to subscriptions being our table name. And once populated here, we should be get good to restart the node, unless, of course, you have incremental data, in which case you'll need to copy the incremental data as well. So let's just note, if you're using the incremental method, copy those files as well. And they're usually stored in the backups directory beneath the table. So it would be beneath subscriptions. So IE var lib Cassandra data web app two subscriptions backups, but we don't have it in this particular case. So copy everything from here because we're not using incremental method. So with that, so long as we copy everything from the latest subscriptions directory, we should be fine. So let's take a look at that latest directory. That's going to be this directory to see what's in there. Those are your files. Copy everything from there. So let's copy 
star into var lib Cassandra. It's rather straightforward data. These are just literally files sitting on a file system that are managed by Cassandra. Web app 2, and these data belong to subscriptions. So it's just a subdirectory of snapshots. Of course, you could store it somewhere else. It's not a problem either. So once you've copied them in there, providing there are no additional files, such as incremental files, you can restart this node, and eventually the other nodes will learn about the dropped key space, and you'll be back in shape. So let's bin Cassandra F, fire this up. It'll know about the new data, and then begin propagation to the remote nodes, and they'll know about it momentarily. So the last step for us is to restart Cassandra on restored node. It's rather straightforward and can be scripted rather easily. The steps are not many, five steps, maybe six if you have incremental files. And it's largely just parsing out which of these timestamped directories or snapshot directories happen to be the latest. Let's just also note it is usually, of course, advantageous to separate the following, as we've mentioned when we started our studies. One, commit log. Two, data directory. And three, snapshots directory. And separate the following, let's say, to distinct volumes. And of course the reason should be obvious. You'll stream I.O. to let's say three different disks, three different platters, or three different SSDs, or three different locations. And you'll also reduce the likelihood of failure and inability to restore. Now let's go back and check if our key space is in place. A quick SQL shell. Describe key spaces, and there we see web app 2, so it's back in place. So the restoration is largely, if you're not using an incremental method, the flushing of the commit logs, which is basically your transaction log, and restoration of the DB files from the key space per table as necessary. If you drop tables, for example, or remove data, then just restore the table data to the most recent snapshot. And then of course clear snapshot is another option that can help you to clean matters up. So five clear snapshots. And that's just a matter of using PSSH across all nodes as we've already done. And with node tool, clear snapshots. Just take this instance. And that'll suffice to clear matters up. Across the nodes. Picking any node, for example, node tool, no options. Grep clear. And it shows you what you can clear. Optionally key spaces if you'd like, or particular snapshots if of interest and this will free you up some space accordingly so again there's a lot more you can do with cassandra we just want to have an initial look because the world of big data no sql in the distribution of data in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion is fast becoming the way in which we manage large data sets as opposed to using traditional RDBMSs. So certainly have a look on data stacks and Apache Cassandra's website to get some more information about what you can do with this wonderful NoSQL implementation. It certainly is a revolutionary way of distributing large sets of data in a reliable fashion. And we haven't backgrounded anything or used any scripts. We're basically just launching it the way you would in developer mode, just having the instances ready to go as we need them. The rest is basic Linux and Unix. You can find scripts, or perhaps just get the bundle from Datastax, which includes everything for your platform, whether Red Hat, CentOS, Ubuntu, Debian, etc. That'll take care of running the appropriate scripts behind the scenes, giving you stop and start and restart functions, and JVM, JRE issues, and so on. So that's a little bit about Cassandra.